for these yeah. jokes. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Dana Peterson. I'm a partner at Cypher Shaw here in this office in Century City, and my specialty is labor and employment. Um, I do litigation as well as advice and counsel. Um, and I'll let my co-panelists introduce themselves. Uh, and my name is Holger Besch. I'm from the downtown LA office. I'm Robert Milligan. I'm a partner in our Century City office. Okay. So we've divided up the um, presentation amongst the three of us to talk about three different um, distinct topics within the um, scope of art of performance management, employee discipline, and employee separations and sort of the life cycle of what that looks like and to provide you guys with some best practices. Um, it's a pretty small group here. So um, if you guys have any questions as we go along, by all means, raise your hand. Um, you don't have to save them for the end, um, but we are gonna be taking this in chunks of 20 minutes each, starting with me. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about performance management, starting with some performance management best practices. This obviously is not an all-inclusive list, um, but it highlights, I think, some of the um, areas where I see missteps happening most frequently, um, and when I when then missteps that oftentimes can lead to litigation. Um, and so those are the ones that I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on primarily, starting with providing performance feedback on a regular basis. So this is very important, not only from a, 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 a legal compliance standpoint, as you know, there's no legal requirement that you give performance feedback or that you give it in any particular form. But oftentimes when you want to separate an employee um, and that separation ends in litigation or ends up in litigation, not having that documentation is obviously going to be very detrimental to you proving that you had a legitimate non-discriminatory non-retaliatory reason for the termination um, and so having performance feedback that's given in real time that's given on a regular basis um, and that's documented well is so so important to have um, as you all know, the statute of limitations for bringing a claim for wrongful termination or some of the other statutory claims, um, they've got three years now to file their complaint with the state agency. And then while the state agency investigates, um, the statute of limitation is told. And then after the state agency completes its investigation or issues a right to sue letter, the employee has one more year. Um, before they need to file their lawsuit. So memories fade over this period of time. Managers leave. Um, you know, so you may be on the receiving end of a very detailed 60 page complaint talking about how stellar this um, plaintiff's um, uh, performance was. And if you go to the file and there's no documentation um, to state otherwise, it's, you're going to be in a world of hurt trying to go back and recreate something that happened five, six, seven years ago. So very, very important to do the performance, give the performance feedback, and document it. Now, when I say document it, I mean document it well. Um, when I, I tell people, you know, don't, we, we want you to create evidence that you can use later on to, to prove your legitimate non retaliatory reason, but we don't want you creating bad evidence. So, training your managers or the people who are pre preparing the performance reviews to stay away from stereotypical terms, um, to give examples. If there's, if they're, um, if they have performance feedback for somebody that's a more of a subjective thing, like your communication style um, needs improvement. Give some examples in there about what do you mean by communication style? Like this is you know, you, you um, approach this this meeting in this way um, using you know, this tone that was very off-putting to people or whatever it is, or you failed to communicate back with people. They didn't. They were not clear about what the deliverables were, which created problems for the team. You know, very specific examples of some of those more subjective terms and staying away from things like, well, um, your demeanor was a little aggressive. Um, I have a case right now, it's a gender harassment discrimination case where that was the feedback given to the female manager who's now turning around and saying, well, if that exact behavior had been engaged in by a man, it wouldn't have been deemed to be aggressive. That's a gender stereotype that because I was being assertive, I was being too aggressive because I'm a woman. Um, so I think training your managers too to be careful about certain phrases to stay away from or how things could be um, you know, turned around um, when that's not what they intended with the, with the feedback is very important to do. Um, and don't wait for the employee's annual review. I mean, depending on how frequently you do the review cycle, um, a lot of employers do it once a year. But if you have critical feedback for an employee and you wait until the very end of the year to give it to, to the employee, 
that's going to be a problem for, for him or her because they're going to be thinking, gosh, if you had told me this six months ago, I would have corrected it by now, but I had no idea. So giving the feedback in real time um, and then documenting it in an email or in some, it doesn't have to be a, you know, a long memo, but just some documentation that, hey, just want to reiterate, we had this conversation. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that, that there's going to be improvement. I know that you you've, have a lot of talent and that I fully anticipate we're going to turn this around. These are the things we talked about. Boom, boom, boom. That's all it has to be. And then at the end of the year, then that can be wrapped up into the performance review with a discussion about, well, we talked about this six months ago and we've seen improvement or we haven't seen improvement. I mean, I think it's just a much more effective way of managing performance and setting aside the potential legal claims of somebody saying, you know what you, um, I had no issues at all uh, throughout the year. And then um, right after I filed my workers' compensation claim, or you know, filled in the blank of the protected activity, I got a performance review just bashing my performance. Well, all of the feedback may be legitimate, but the fact that, that it wasn't given throughout the year and was given to the employee after they engaged in protected activity can create a potential problem for you, right? I mean, the, the, the optics of it are not great, even though, again, the feedback may be completely legitimate and not at all retaliatory, the optics are not great. So doing it throughout the year um, is, is a much, much better practice. Um, and you can also use your performance management, whatever it, whatever it takes the form of. If it's a 360 reviews or if it's the traditional, you know, five page performance um, evaluation. You can use those performance um, reviews as an opportunity to reinforce your cor corporate culture. Um, let's see. Yeah, okay. Um, to re so what I mean by that is, and I just, just did a presentation on, um, on corporate or on culture audits, and this seems to be a really big hot topic now for a lot of our clients and a lot of employers. And that is, what is our corporate culture? Um, what do we have on our website? What do we put out there to the public? Is this this is who we are as a company? What are we What are we projecting internally to our employees? What is What do we want our culture to be? And if it's things like we really um, encourage our employees to get involved in some of the, you know, for us it would be pro bono activities that that we do, where we provide free legal services to um, underserved communities or to pro, um, to nonprofit organizations or charities. Um, and so we want this to be an example. We really encourage our attorneys to take on pro bono matters because we think it's good to give back to the community, and that's who, as a firm, what we're all about. So. Using actually having that as part of the performance review to the extent you're encouraging people to to engage in those types of activities. Included in the in the review, give them feedback like, hey, Dana did 80 hours of pro bono um, work this year. You know, great job. And that's like a, you get like a whatever 5 in that in that category, um, because if people, if people th think they're going to be reviewed on it, they're going to do it more likely than just, you know, out of the kindness of your heart, can you, you know, participate in this Habitat for Humanity event that we have going on this weekend um, on your free time, but people who do engage and they contribute to whatever initiatives or the kind of corporate culture you're trying to drive, that time should be, or that those efforts should be recognized. And using the performance evaluation process to reinforce those kinds of messages, I think is a good opportunity. Um, Again, where I said, I already talked about the good documentation is so vital and clearly communicating expectations to employees when you're managing performance. Um, you know, there's, it, it's not infrequent that I see, or there's been a complete misconnect between what the manager was expecting and what the employee thought they were supposed to do. Um, and so having, you know, when you're, when you're managing somebody's performance, doing it either in the performance review or throughout the, the, the year, um, just kind of check ins on this is what this is what I expect. Um, and do you have any do you have any questions or, or concerns about that? Is there you know, giving giving clear direct instructions um, and guidance as to what it is that's expected so that you don't have that misconnect. We have an employee who says, I thought I was performing optimally. I thought it was meeting all expectations. And again, now I'm hearing after fill in the blank on the acti protected activity or because I'm the only woman on the team or because I'm only, you know, the, my, my protected class, um, I'm being told that I'm not performing optimally. And then it becomes sort of a, she said, she said, he said, he said, you know, he said, she said type of situation where you've got the manager saying, no, that's not what was expected. Um, but you've got no documentation. It's really the manager's word against the, the employees. And this is where being consistent is also very important. 
um, making sure that you are treating all similarly situated employees in the same job category with the same role and expectations consistently. I mean, it happens. It's human nature that we tend to have favorites. Um, there may be one employee who's just absolutely phenomenal, knocking it out of the park, um, but then on one occasion drops the ball on something or doesn't quite deliver the same at the same level that you're used to seeing. But because this person is such a standout employee who never causes any problems, um, they get a free pass or, or they're not, that's not addressed with them versus somebody else who is not as, you know, well thought of or someone who has other performance issues um, that's going to get jumped on right away. And that person is going to be written up or is going to be counseled on it. Those types of inconsistencies obviously create problems because then it leads to the question of, well, why am I being treated differently? And it's not, you know, it doesn't take much for the employee to grab onto, you know, some, some protected class or some protected activity that they think must be the reason why they're being treated differently when in fact it doesn't have anything to do with that. But again, the optics are bad. So treating employees, treating them the same and being consistent is very, very important. And then differentiating between performance issues that can be fixed and those that can't. So when we talk about performance management, the idea is you've got an employee who you believe can be managed to perform better. Um, or, or you have um, an, an employee who you pretty quickly identify as maybe not having the requisite skill set needed for the job that they're expected to do. I mean, it happens now maybe with a, like a, a new hire. You find out pretty quickly that this person that you just hired actually either misrepresented their qualifications or overstated their qualifications. And once you start actually um, you know, reviewing their performance or they're, they're in the role, you identify pretty quickly, oh, you know what, this person doesn't know how to, how to use Outlook. This person doesn't know how to use Excel. And that is an essential function of the job. They said that they were well-versed in it, but they clearly don't know anything about Excel and that's a problem. Um, so those are the types of things like you can identify issues that, well, we're not gonna you know, go train this person um, this is a job you have to have this skill set already, and they don't have it, um, you know, documented, and that's the end of the day. Versus something like, um, you know, they're showing up five minutes late every day. Well, that's probably easily correctable. You know, just remind them about the time that they need to be here, and then hold them accountable for being there at a certain time. Or, you know, things like, um, you know, you're you're not communicating clearly enough, um, and give some examples. And then that's something obviously that can probably be. Be, be coached or you know, they can be managed on and their performance will improve. Um, that's what performance management is really all about is, is either identifying very quickly that this person doesn't have the skill set that you need, documenting it, managing that, or coaching them to better performance. And there's always the issues of like, somebody brings a gun to the workplace. That's not a performance management issue. That's like a blatant policy violation. Those are not things that would you know, trigger um, an obligation to manage their performance. Um, okay. So, again, managing performance without getting sued. Like, is, is there really such a way, such a thing? Like, I tell people, you know, oh, um, the, the term harassment is probably the most overused word in, a, a, in an employee's vocabulary. You know, oh, I came to work late and my boss is harassing me about it. Or, you know, they, they keep harassing me to get this project in. Like, that's not harassment. That's 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 managing performance and um oftentimes when somebody brings a lawsuit for wrongful termination or you know the whole list of other horribles they not only name the company but as you know they name the individual manager as well who can have some a personal liability for harassment and and some other things um so i tell the individual managers when i meet them for the first time look you're a manager you can expect in this day and age that at some point in your career, you're probably going to be the subject of either litigation, a demand letter, um, or some kind of a complaint. Because if you're doing your job well and you're holding people accountable, some people are going to be unhappy about that. And who sues you? Unhappy people. Um, so this is just part of, frankly, being a, a manager. Um, but there's, a, I think, some tips um, that will lessen the likelihood of being on the receiving end of litigation. Um, the first bullet point here, be wary of the appearance of retaliation. So some of the examples that I gave before, like take doing performance counseling of somebody who's never had performance counseling before, and it's done right after they engage in protected activity. So that may not be, again, it may not be retaliation. It may just be, well, yeah, this person did have this workers' comp claim, just filed this workers' comp claim, but then they really blew it with this project they were supposed to do. Like, it's legitimate that the timing worked out just that way because that's when the performance issues arose. So you want to make sure, again, that you're documenting that. 
you're documenting the non-retaliatory legitimate reason for why you're taking this action now um, when it's so close in time to protected activity. Um, so again, just be wary of the appearance of retaliation. It doesn't mean I hear people say, well, I, this person is untouchable. They just came back from maternity leave. Um, they asked for a reasonable accommodation um, and they just um, made a complaint of some um, you know, some labor code violation um, that they think is widespread amongst the organizations. So you've got like a whistleblower and like I'm and, and and now this person is not quite performing that well, but I'm not gonna address it because this person is, you know, I'm 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 scared of touching that. That's the wrong approach. You still have to manage people's performance, even if they engage in protected activity or they're in a protected class, you just have to make sure you're documenting again the legitimate non-retaliatory reason for whatever action you're gonna take. And that's where I tell um, you know, frontline managers, this is an opportunity to get with HR, get with your in-house counsel to just make sure you're dotting all your I's and crossing all of your T's so that you've got the documentation to show, um, again, legitimate non-retaliatory reason. And that's something that for, for you all, make sure that your managers know that they should be reaching out to, to you or to whoever is designated in your organization just to put eyes on that to make sure that it's being done in a way that's going to protect you if it's, if it's necessary down the road. Um, be respectful, compassionate, and, and kind. Um, now that's not to say that we're not going to address performance issues, or we're not going to be, um, very firm with our expectations, but there's a way of delivering it. That's going to automatically offend people or put them on the defense and a way of delivering it. That they're going to be much more receptive to, to the message. And you're more likely to get a positive outcome where it looks like you're really trying to help this employee that you believe the effort is worthwhile to put the time and effort into coaching them and to being very clear about the expectations because you want them to succeed. Um, and make this more of a, I want to see you succeed type of conversation as opposed to you're a complete screw up kind of a conversation. Um, and that will go a long way to fostering goodwill with your, with, with your employees um, and make it less likely that they're going to look for some reason to, to sue you or, you know, quit. And now you've got to backfill the position um, because they were just very, very unhappy. Um, again, don't delay address issues as they arise. We kind of already talked about that in the, the best practices for performance management, but obviously you know, that this, this is a, how many times do you hear like a manager comes in and says, I've had it with this person. Like, I just cannot take another day. Like, I want to fire them. I want to fire them today. You're like, okay, well, let me see the, let me see the performance write-ups. Oh, I haven't done any, but this has been going on for a long time. I want to fire this person today. It's like, uh, uh, time out. Right. That's, that's, that's a problem. Um, and that's why you have to give the performance feedback in real time or, you know, or, or close in time to when the problems arise and don't delay because you're going to, if you delay, you're going to potentially create a situation where either you're not going to be able to terminate somebody because you haven't documented things and it needs to be documented and you haven't given the employee an opportunity to improve because they weren't aware they had these issues. And so now you're gonna have to go back and do all of that. Um, and it could have been something that could have been addressed a long time ago. Uh, we already talked about educating managers on phrases, words to avoid, and then document, 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 document. I can't say that enough times. Um, okay, so terminations. So say you do all of this performance coaching, performance management, it's all documented. You've been very clear. You've been very consistent with the messaging, but the person's performance just doesn't turn around. And now we're at the point where you know, we're, we're looking to separate the employee. This is probably the riskiest time in the life cycle of, of employment, right? Um, it's terminations are the ones that usually will lead to, to litigation. And so always, always review um, to assess the legal risk. You know, make sure before you make that termination decision, do we have our documentation all in a row? Do we feel confident that we'll be able to articulate to a trier of fact if necessary, um, our legitimate, non-discriminatory, non-retaliatory reasons for the termination decision. Do we have our, our documentation in the row? Um, and then plan for the termination meeting. Um, you know, you can't, it's now it is, especially in California, um, you've got to put some time and effort into, into preparing for the termination. Um, think about the timing and location. Um, you know, are you, are, what, what time of day are we going to do this? Are we going to do it first thing in the morning? Are we going to do it at the end of the day? Do we want to do it on a Monday? You know, what, what's the best time that's going to, um, mitigate, uh, 
the employee being embarrassed or a lot of people being around or a time when people are going to be available, a time when you can get a private conference room. Um, those are all things that you should think about location. Obviously, you want to, if you're going to have an in person meeting with somebody, you're terminating them. You want to make sure you've got a private um, location where you can have that conversation with them away from other people, um, because that could lead to, you know, privacy issues um, and also just be very embarrassing for the employee and lead them to want to come up with a reason to sue you. Um, consider possible security risks. If you have a particularly volatile employee who is very, very angry or somebody who you think could potentially become violent or become a security risk, you need to plan for that in advance. Um, if something, if you are aware that somebody is a, as a security risk, um, and you fail to take appropriate action and somebody gets hurt, that could be a, a significant um, liability issue for you. And so you always want to be mindful in these situations. If there's going, if there's a potential um, for security concerns that you've got that, you've got whoever you need to also be in the room with you, or you do it offsite, or you do it via Zoom, whatever the, the case may be. So you address those. In California, as we all know, you have to pay everybody their all their final wages due, including all accrued and unused vacation and used sick time has to all be included in the final paycheck that you give to them on the day that you're terminating them. Different if somebody quits and they don't give you, you know, more than 72 hours notice, you get more time. But if you're involuntarily terminating someone, you have to give them their paycheck on their last day and failing to do that can create all sorts of cost um, down the road. And so you've got to plan for that. And I'm going to give you like a cautionary tale because I literally just saw this opinion from the DLSE. Um, an employee had taken um, supplemental paid sick leave. They were out for, they thought that they had COVID, um, but they never submitted. They, they called out and said, hey, I've got symptoms of COVID. I'm going to go get tested. Um, and then uh, they, the, they, the, the employer said, you know, we've got tests here. We've got an on-site clinic, like come down and get tested here and never heard back from the employee. So they didn't count that day as a, as a supplemental paid sick day. And then the next day they didn't hear from the employee. And then the next day um, they heard back from the employee that um, he in fact got tested and he had, he had, I think he got tested. He didn't have COVID, but he still had symptoms. Um, so they started paying him his supplemental paid sick leave on that third day. Um, but not for the first the first two days. And so then they, they ended up terminating him. Um, and the DLSE determined that they owed him the 16 hours of supplemental paid sick leave and they didn't include it in the final paycheck. So they owed him $352 for the 16 hours. But the judgment was over 8,000 because in addition to the 352, there was the statutory penalties for failing to pay supplemental paid sick leave. It's three times the amount owed. So that was an additional thousand dollars. And then there was the penalty for having incorrect wage statements because the wage statements didn't include the, the correct allocation of paid sick leave that had been taken. So then you've got an additional you know, $2,400 penalty for that. And then you've got waiting time penalties because it's been more than 30 days since that employee left. So you've got the, you know, every day, um, days wages times 30 added onto that. That's an additional $4,415. So again, for not including that in his final paycheck, you know, you can see how, and, oh, and there was interest tacked onto that too. So it can become very, very expensive. So you need to make sure when you're preparing for that termination meeting that you're sure you've got all of the accrued time in there, including payment for any sick time the employee took. We all know you don't have to pay out for, for unused sick, sick time, but make sure that they get paid for all the sick time that they took. Um, and then use talking points. I'm a big advocate on preparing for the termination meeting and having talking points um, because it can be a very, as you can imagine, um, a pretty volatile or uncomfortable situation for the employee who may want to argue, may want to debate um, the reasons for the termination, which you never want to do. This decision's already been made, um, and here's here's the reason in a very brief, succinct um, explanation, and then next steps. Here's your paycheck. Here's you know, get the EDD information. Um, and stay on script. If you have that script, it's much easier to stay on point than if you're just kind of winging it and then you end up getting into a big old dialogue with the employee or you say things that, oops, I probably shouldn't have said that. Um, stay on script. And then um, have a plan for how you're going to collect equipment and computers, um, whatever, whatever stuff that you need to get back from the employee. And Robert's gonna talk a little bit about some of that too. Um, but have a plan in place and, and, and be mindful because it's like, this might be the last opportunity you have to talk to this individual. So if they've got stuff that you need back, you need to have a plan to get it back and, and get an agreement from them how that's, gonna, how that's gonna work. And lastly, just like when you're managing somebody's performance, compassion, kindness um, goes a long way. 
Um, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I very, very rarely have seen, um, you know, litigation with employees who feel like they were treated absolutely respectfully. It always comes from a place where somebody feels disrespected. So that's, this is a good opportunity during a termination meeting just to make sure that it's a difficult decision and it's not an easy conversation to have, but you can still do it in a compassionate, respectful and kind way. Passing it over to you. All right, great. All right, now we're gonna jump into uh, trade secrets and uh, you may be thinking, well, what does trade secrets have to do with, you know, performance management and uh, uh, discipline and separations, but, um, it can have a lot to do with it, particularly if you have a disgruntled employee um, who has access to, you know, confidential information or trade secrets. Um, certainly, if that person is upset and wants to harm the company, they could give that information to a competitor. They could put it on the internet. They could do harm to the company. So, apart from our narrow topic on performance management and uh, separations, um, there's obviously a whole other world about trade secrets and. Um, I'm the co-chair of our national trade secret and non-compete group, so I can speak outside of California, but also inside of California. What I like to tell people about trade secrets in California is that if you can do trade secrets right in California, you could probably do trade secrets right throughout the country because California's courts have such exacting requirements about identification of trade secrets. And then you have that whole overlay of California prohibiting non-competes. Um, in other parts of the country, obviously, non-competes are, are a me method and mechanism that companies use to actually protect trade secrets. But when I talk to a California audience, their eyes kind of grow back and say, well, no, they're just not allowed in California. And that's true. Um, and so that's why if you can do things right with a non-disclosure agreement and have you know, good examples and specific um, explanations of what your trade secrets are in your non-disclosure agreements, um, and your company, your employees sort of buy into that that's your information, you're going to be on the front foot to be effectively be able to enforce uh, in California. One of the key things about a trade secret is it's built into the definition of a trade secret that you have reasonable secrecy measures. So you may have the most valuable information in the world, but if you do not do a good job of protecting that information, it's not going to be of value in the eyes of the court. So that's why it's incumbent upon HR professionals and labor and employment attorneys to make sure that they have good policies and good um, agreements with their employees um, because it's built into the very definition of a trade secret about having those reasonable secrecy measures. And so these are, as you'll see on the screen, these are some of the uh, low hanging fruit as far as things that courts have found to be um, uh, examples of reasonable secrecy measures. Um, oftentimes people ask, well, can I just have an employee handbook? Do I actually have to have an agreement? You should have an agreement. You should have a non-disclosure agreement. Your non-disclosure agreement at a minimum should at least provide examples of what your company considers to be the most important information to the company. Now, a lot of people like to pull things off the internet, have forums, have lots of different categories so that they don't miss everything. That's fine. Uh, courts are scrutinizing those more. But at a minimum, you need to, if you talk to the executives and you ask them, what does the company consider our trade secrets? Is it something in our software? Is it our you know, business plans, whatever? That should be in one of the examples in your uh, non-disclosure agreement. Um, you know, with um, computers these days, um, obviously you wanna make sure that they're password protected. One thing that Dana brought up as far as the exit interview, and if you, if you forget one thing, if you don't, if you remember one thing for this presentation, Things that come up recurring in these trade secret cases, particularly when you're dealing with Macintosh um, and um, iPads, is make sure in that exit interview you get the uh, password information. A lot of times you'll think that IT keeps a good uh, log of what the passwords are. They don't. And <laughs> you're not going to be able to forensically analyze those um, devices if you don't have the username and the password. Um, and that could, and if you have serious concerns that, that an employee has taken data, if you don't have the password, you're not going to be able to analyze that. You probably heard that in, in the criminal law context where they have the, the iPhone, but they can't access it because it's encrypted. It comes up a lot of times in employee investigations. Um, and one, one thing you'll see is, um, you know, you need to have the agreements, you need to have the policies. 
Um, you need to have, you know, sort of the uh, technology mechanisms, like if you're, you're a company that allows USB devices, or if you fill those USB devices in, don't, don't allow, you know, you lock those down. Uh, those are sort of the things that you need to be mindful of. You know, obviously when you log into a computer, having um, designations that you're in, you know, you're um, accessing a, a, a company protected computer and that you agree to abide by those, um, those policies and procedures. Now, courts, you know, it could be just like you and me, uh, judges have expectations about what they view as minimal secrecy measures. They may ask you when you're in court, well, did you have a, a log on and a prompt that that warned the employee that, you know, this information belongs to the company? Um, you know, did you have a non-disclosure agreement? Um, one, one trick is oftentimes companies will do a good job with their employees of having policies and procedures, but that same information, they may allow contractors or third parties or vendors to have access to that same information without any sort of non-disclosure requirements. And courts will point to that, that you, you don't have full protection, and so I'm not going to protect that type of information. Courts, particularly in California, go out of their way at really ex examining and second-guessing what your secrecy measures are. Um, but the things that you see on the screamers, you know, sort of um, um, low, low hanging fruit as far as minimum standards. Um, employee education is key. Um, ideally, you have a, a workforce that's buying into why you're protecting this information and that 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 takes a while. Um, for those that are interested, um, we have a complimentary treaties. There's a whole chapter on. Um, uh, Creating a culture of confidentiality, and it's it's penned by a um, in-house counsel at um, Intel, Janet Craycroft, and she talks about the importance of getting the employees buy-in about why it's important to protect the confidential information, how their livelihood, how their advancement in the company is tied to keeping the proprietary intellectual property, you know, protected, and it's a it's a good thing to um, to shoot for. It's sort of the gold standard. But if you have an engaged workforce that's looking out for your secrets, you're going to be much, much more able to protect those secrets. And so when you're putting together um, a trade secret protection plan, um, you need to recognize that, you know, absolute secrecy is not required. You don't have to be a Superman or Wonder Woman. Uh, it's reasonable under the circumstances, but just know in California that they, high, they hold you to an even higher standard than other parts of the country. country. Um, when you're identifying the trade secrets, at a minimum, you should try to get input from the stakeholders, uh, people on the technology side, uh, business leaders, the sales force. Make sure that at least you have examples built into your NDA that covers what they're doing in their space. Um, you know, the law changes. Um, and so you want to make sure that your language in your non disclosure agreement and your policies complies with the latest greatest. Um, you know, certainly whistleblower protections across the country have become more important um, under the federal act. You're required to have this magic language uh, protecting uh, whistleblowers. It's the defend trade secret. Um, uh, statute, but even in California, there's protections for whistleblowers. So you need to make sure you have that carve out in your um, example um, in your in your form agreement. Um, we've seen some action recently uh, with the Biden administration and a number of the agencies, uh, particularly as SEC. If you're an SEC uh, reported company, um, the SEC is asking for specific language that makes it clear that if you're reporting SEC violations, that 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 doesn't prevent the employee from sharing that type of confidential information. Um, but like I said, employee buy-in is the key. If you can put together a, a protection plan where uh, the employees are sort of your eyes and ears and that they understand why the important, why the information is important. Um, and that comes up often in the, uh, the onboarding uh, training throughout uh, employment, as well as in the offboarding. Uh, one thing to think about is when you're interviewing, this is, you know, this could be a high risk area when you're interviewing a competitor's employees, um, you know, First off, you kind of need to understand that space. Is this a, a space where there's a lot of uh, mobility and competitors don't really um, squawk? Um, or is it a situation where, you know, there's often, you know, there's often battles It can result in cease and desist letters. It can result in, you know, litigation. So kind of understanding, you know, your space um, and making sure that you have procedures in place um, where um, the people that are interviewing the candidate are not asking the wrong things. 
Uh, I have several cases right now where, uh, not surprisingly, uh, they're asking all the wrong things. They want to know about the customers. They want to know about how successful those customers are. They want to know what projects those customers are working on. Um, you could probably think about in your organization, maybe the sales force and uh, folks that are in the sales force. And if they if they get their hands on a candidate of a competitor, the types of questions they may ask. So that's sort of an area where you want to make sure on the on the front end, the people, the managers, um, the workforce that are interviewing uh, candidates from competitors uh, know sort of the do's and don'ts. You know, don't be soliciting information that could be viewed as confidential uh, by the competitor. Uh, and really focus on the generalized skills and knowledge and expertise of the uh, employee. Uh, easier said than done. There's often gray areas in that in that regard. Um, but you can think about the parade of horrors about the questions not to ask uh, a competitor's employee. It's oftentimes people ask me, well, should I ask for what agreements that the employee has, you know, before extending an offer? Absolutely. There seems to be like this hesitation that you're, you're, you, you don't want to know because you don't want to have a tortious interference claim, but you want to know going in what this, what baggage this employee may have um, and before you extend the offer. So you can make an educated decision about whether, um, the, you know, the, the punch is worth the squeeze uh, with respect to that employee. That's particularly the true um, outside of California where they may have non competes or non solicits. You want to know going in eyes wide open what type of baggage the employee may have. And then, once you hire the, uh, the you know, the employee, um, you want to make sure that you're letting them know about your expectations. Um, you probably ask them to sign a non disclosure agreement. You're educating them about your employees, uh, your company's policies, um, the importance of those policies. Um, and if it's a really high sensitive hire where there may be overlapping technologies or real exposure, like, you know, they may be taking trade secrets or using trade secrets, whether that's customer lists or software, things of that sort, you want to be checking in to make sure that the employee knows that they, they don't need, they don't, they shouldn't have any of their former employer's data. They shouldn't be putting that information on their system. And you may want to follow up with the manager if you if you've had situations with this particular department where they like to take chances, they're risk takers. That's kind of the high risk area, right? You, you want to check in on those folks and make sure that you know um, Sally or Bob learned their lesson from the last cease and desist letter or the last lawsuit, um, so that you have you know good guardrails in place. Um, you know, in California, the typical agreements um, that you should have in place, you know, non-disclosure agreements, um, invention assignment agreements. One key thing that can help you in a trade secret lawsuit, if you have an acknowledgement in your agreement um, that the employee understands that under no circumstances are they to use your, their former employer's information and an attestation that they don't have any of their employer's data. Uh, that can help you um, if you're facing a lawsuit for bad faith misappropriation. Um, you know, BYOD policies, social media, ship, media ownership policies, computer use policies. Uh, like I said, one of the hot items lately is the whistleblower protections and making sure your industry standard as it relates to whistleblower protections. That's a real high profile item, real high importance item for the, the, um, the Biden administration, as well as the Newsom administration. They want to make sure that employees know that they can blow the whistle on employers that may be mis misbehaving. Where that line is between confidential information, trade secret information, and blowing the whistle, you know, it, it, it depends upon in different organizations, but there, that is an area where there is a lot of scrutiny. Um, just as sort of a hit list, and I, we're happy to talk to a lot, all, about all these items during the cocktail hour if you have particular concerns. Um, you know, there's been cases recently about overly broad non-disclosure agreements where they're trying to protect everything under the sun. Uh, everything's a trade secret, even if it's on their website. So you need to, you know, sort of issue spot that and, you know, really try to hone in on information that's actually, you know, secret. Um, another, you know, another issue that we've seen is with uh, forum selection clauses and choice of law clauses. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, the way that I deal with the California issue is that I'll just specify another state's law. You know, I'll specify Florida where you can have a two year non compete and, you know, everything's a trade secret. Um, that doesn't work in California, right? You, there's the California Labor Code section 925. You can't ask an employee to sign 
uh, out of state choice of law or um, out of state you know, forum. Um, so that's one thing that you should make sure you're current in that regard. Uh, that's going to be somewhere something that um, is going to be subject. In, uh, employers to um, you know PAGA lawsuits and class action lawsuits if they're if they're using those um, old old forms. We've also seen if you're in the technology space, we've also seen things on um, overly broad invention assignment agreements where you're trying to protect inventions after the employee leaves. So they'll draft it in a way that says that there's a rebuttable presumption that this belongs to our company um, if it's related to our business. Uh, one year after you leave, and the courts have frowned upon that and said that 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 violates sixteen six hundred. Um, you know, if you guys are in the you know uh, if you if you're in the technology space or you do a lot of joint venture agreements, on the bright side, most recently the California Supreme Court has allowed non competes in the business to business uh, context, and you know that's that's an area where. You have to do very careful drafting, but it, it was an eye opener to a lot of us who thought that uh, California didn't want non competes whatsoever, only in the in the sale of business context. But so we're seeing we're seeing some openings in that regard. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to make sure we spend enough time for um, uh, Holger um, on the exit interview process, and this kind of dovetails with um, what Dana was saying, uh, whether it's an employee you know termination or. Um, as far as for performance or the employee um, is leaving um, on their own cord, it's very important to have an exit interview. Um, you know, if, if you're a remote workforce at this point, or, you know, you, the employee is a remote worker, you need to take that into account as far as the exit interview. Um, sort of the key things are making sure you get the, um, the computer back. You know, if it's a company cell phone, getting the company cell phone back, getting the passwords. Um, if they have social media accounts that belong to the company, making sure you get those um, passwords back. And, um, you know, going into that exit interview, if, you know, you're not going to do this for every employee, um, but if it's a high level employee um, or an employee that you have concerns about that may compete or that may do harm to the company, that is not going to take the termination well and is going to, you know, leak data or post things on the internet, that's where you want to make, you want to take a look at their email activity. Uh, you may want to look at their computer activity. Um, you know, oftentimes, and there's an article I gave you, it's important if you're going to do it correctly is to um, have a computer forensic. If you're a large enough company, you, your IT professionals, some of them have computer forensic training. If not, you can get a vendor who can, you know, image the computer and then hold that for a rainy day uh, to take a look at the results to see if the employee, you know, put data on a, uh, in the cloud or put data on a um, USB device. Um, but the more legwork you can do getting uh, going into the exit interview, the better. If you know they're going to a competitor, you know, asking those questions about what are you gonna do, who's gonna be your supervisor, that doesn't mean they have to ask answer the question, but that could be a red flag for you if they're not willing to um, provide that information, that there could be some issues and that you may wanna send them a reminder of obligation letter or a, uh, a cease and desist letter to their new employer. Um, Another um, the classic mistake that we see is for, for forgetting to turn off the, the employee uh, computer access, um, particularly if it's cloud based applications, uh, things in the cloud, and the employee will still be able to access that information after ex after their exit interview and exfiltrate it and use it at their uh, former employer or their new employer. Um, and so that's something to take into account is make sure you coordinate with IT. Uh, to cut off their um, access. There's a number of uh, various options about reminder of obligation letters, cease and desist letters. One thing that I found that's effective is at an exit interview um, certification. Get some representation from the employee that they're gonna abide by their non-disclosure and that they've returned all company information. Um, that's a, that can be a few, couple, a few paragraphs and that's something that you can use later if it turns out that they in fact retain company data that you can use to be in a more a powerful position if you need to communicate with their um, with their uh, current employer that essentially this employee either made a mistake or they lied to us. That's why we have legitimate concerns. Uh, with that, um, just a few items. We have a 50 state survey that will be coming out shortly. We've updated it every year. It normally comes out in early December. Uh, it has the the law, the trade secret laws, and the non compete laws in all 50 states. Um, that's going to that's available on our trade secret um, blog, which is uh, tradesecretslaw.com. Like I said, I have a few copies of our uh, trade secret um, um, treaties. It covers all these topics in more detail. If you're interested, you can have a copy, a complimentary copy. With that, I'll turn it over to Holger. All right.
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about reductions in force. Uh, I'm sure, we've all been seeing in the news the recent tech industry mass layoffs, Twitter, Facebook. Um, you know, about three, four months ago, there were a lot of, sort of prophylactic layoffs taking place. Uh, so I will become as no surprise if 2023 brings a lot more reductions in force. So here's just a little primer on what to think about uh, when you're dealing with them. The first thing is, should you do a reduction in force at all? Uh, and uh, there are other alternatives um, that are less likely to impact employee morale. Uh, you know, there are also lower, lower legal risks when you take these alternatives into account. Uh, whether you actually implement them or not, honestly, because uh, if you've gone through the process and you have documented considering uh, whether you have alternatives to a RIF that will help you uh, in the legal field down the line. Um, and also just think about, you know, signals to the marketplace uh, is, is, a, is an alternative to a RIF uh, better for your business. Um, some of those alternatives, uh, they're mandatory time without pay. Uh, you've got pay freezes, you've got job sharing, uh, their voluntary separation plans are alternative. Those require significant advanced planning. Uh, so if you want to do something like that, I think it's a, it's a longer pipeline to get that done. Um, uh, pay reductions are obviously always an op option and temporary shutdowns. Temporary shutdowns get a little tricky because there are a lot of termination implications with temporary shutdowns. Uh, so anytime you're implementing a furlough, you want to think about whether you're triggering uh, you know, termination pay statutes, uh, WARN, WARN Act notice requirements, et cetera. So it's just something to be aware of. <clears throat> okay, but for step one in a, in a RIF is you really want to uh, document the business case. Um, you know, what are the basic reasons for this RIF? Are you trying to reduce costs? Are you, are you, do you need increased profitability and thus need to trim sort of excess fat? Um, is there a change in demand that's causing uh, the RIF? Uh, somewhere in, in your business documentation, you want to identify what, what the business case is for the RIF. Uh, and then consistent with that, you also then want to articulate what the goals are for any reduction. Uh, in other words, are you just trying to save money? Uh, is there some unprofitable work that you've identified that you can uh, link to as the source of, of the, the purpose for the RIF? Um, or is it just simply a matter of we need to reduce a percentage of headcount? Uh, and those factors result will also affect things uh, down the line in terms of disclosures and, and how you decide uh, when you're doing your uh, Older Worker Benefits Protection Act uh, notices, uh, how you structure things. So it's important to understand what the goal is of the RIF uh, from the outset. Um, similarly, uh, you know, you want to document any alternatives that you may have had that you've rejected. Uh, just make sure that, that there's a, a good business case documentation for all of these things. Um, communication plan is, is very important. Uh, so, one of the things that often gets overlooked is making sure managers understand uh, what they should be saying to their employees. Uh, you want to have a communication plan that you know, considers a multiple methods for communicating to the employees, whether it's a written communication, whether it's meetings. Um, but before you engage in that, you want to make sure that your managers are well aware of this communication plan have been trained on it, trained on what to say, what not to say. Uh, you know, it's, it's nothing worse than if you have a reduction in force that involves performance as part of the criteria that you're using. And you have managers sitting down with employees and saying, it's not your fault. I tried to keep you. Uh, that's the last thing you want them to say, because at the end of the day, it was about the performance, right? So, so at least in part. Uh, so it's, it's having a clear plan that involves uh, managers buy-in uh, is very important. Um, and you can do these, these communication plans in stages. There, there can be initial communication. I mean, generally speaking, reductions in force aren't a, a fixed event that is planned from day one, and then it kind of goes through. I mean, it's always a moving target. It's, it's going to come in phases. Uh, who gets selected, who doesn't get selected changes over time. Uh, sometimes the, the uh, ultimate goal of the RIF even changes over time, which is not as desirable, but it's just important to know that it's a, it's a fluid process sometimes, uh, most often. Um, but, you know, as you, as you engage in the communication process, there will be steps from an initial announcement, initial Q&As, later Q&As, just to make sure that employees are aware of, of the process and as, as it goes forward. Um, you do want to explain the reasons for your reduction in force, uh, the, the functions that might be affected uh, in this reduction in force. And then it's always good to preview 
sort of the severance benefits that may be offered. Uh, you don't you don't want to give out releases uh, before the employment relationship is actually over, uh, but you do want to preview what may be available to employees if they uh, receive a severance package. Um, also, you want to consider what external communications uh, you want to be dealing with, uh, whether it's third parties, vendors, customers, uh, even if it's the media or politicians um, or, or investors, uh, and as well as you know, there may be messages to your employees who will remain. Uh, what's what's the messaging? Uh, are, they, are, are they concerned that they might be next? Is there another wave coming? I mean, those are the kinds of communications you want to think about up front uh, before you uh, have this plan in place. Um, <clears throat> Always important, similar to what Dana was talking about earlier, tone. I mean, uh, we, we want to be respectful. We want to be kind. Uh, we want to think about uh, how we communicate uh, reductions to employees, always in a respectful, kind manner. Um, and then sort of last point on this is there really should be a contact person uh, who, who is the main person to engage in discussions about the nature of the RIF, whether it's to the public, whether it's to employees. Just so that you just have a better uh, control over what the messaging that goes out. Um, one of the questions on a reduction in force is who are your employees? I mean, there are all these joint employment questions out there. Uh, you have independent contractor issues, whether those I I K's or ICs are actually uh, employees of yours. You've got agency temps. I mean, the reality is that uh, if you get sued, uh, any one of these groups could potentially sue you in a reduction in force uh, if for you know if they feel treated differently, et cetera. So uh, it's just a matter of identifying who's going to be part of this process. Uh, where do you think your joint employment risks lie? Uh, consider that up front. Um, and, and this is one other point on this too. There's often a disconnect between legal and, and operations on this stuff. Uh, it's really important to get operations buy-in and make sure that legal is sitting in on the on the meetings to determine you know the scope of the RIF, the communications you're engaged in, and just make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, dealing with that also involves looking over your be benefits plans, looking over your severance plans, making sure there's a complete understanding of who's affected uh, by all these um, maneuvers. Okay, um, the next step in your process is making sure you develop defensible RIF selection criteria. Um, ideally, uh, they're gonna be objective factors, uh, at least hev heavily objective factors. Uh, one thing is very important is they need to be work-related. Uh, if you get sued uh, under uh, discrimination statutes, uh, there are two basic standards, but fundamentally, uh, you need to have a work-related reason for, for making these decisions. Um, you wanna give credit for work experience where that's a factor. Uh, you can use seniority as a tiebreaker uh, where anyone's ability is equal. Uh, seniority in and of itself isn't necessarily going to be a factor that avoids litigation. For example, if you recently hired a large group uh, of, of underrepresented minorities and you decide that you're going to terminate based on seniority, well, guess who's going to be uh, adversely impacted by that uh, decision-making criterion? Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, seniority should be a factor can be a factor, uh, but you know you don't want to necessarily decide it on seniority alone. Uh, ideally, uh, a blend of things like performance, seniority, experience, skills, fundamentally everything that's forward looking. Uh, what is the organization going to look like after this RIF? Uh, what what do we what are the skills we need? What, what are the what are the um, various uh, job groups that we need to have uh, filled? That's how you want to structure a RIF. Uh, always forward looking. You don't want to say. Who are my bad performers and how do I get rid of them? That's never what you want to do, right? It should never be used as a performance management tool, even though performance can be a factor. Um, so anyway, other, other objective factors, what, what, what certificates do people have? What actual job skills do people have? Uh, those are the kinds of things that you want to emphasize uh, when you're selecting your RIF criteria, um, <clears throat> especially if it's something that's measurably object, uh, me objectively measurable. Uh, something like sales performance, uh, production revenue, those kinds of things are always very good to, to use as factors. Uh, and, you know, past performance and recent performance, I distinguish it because, you know, there's always some performance that's occurred after the documented uh, performance evaluations. You know, those can both be factors as well. It should be a piece of the puzzle at, at best, uh, but but don't, uh, don't overlook it necessarily. Um, <clears throat> again, functions are the issue, not persons. 
Uh, and then California, particularly, uh, you don't want to use salary uh, as a basis for determining RIF. Uh, salary is effectively a proxy for age. We don't want to decide based on age. So, uh, so there's the government code section that says why you shouldn't do that. Um, okay. Um, next topic is sort of the, the more subjective factors. This is where it gets a little dangerous sometimes, uh, and courts are particularly attuned to looking at subjective judgments in reductions in force because of the potential bias that exists. Uh, but fundamentally, things like communication skills, organization skills, teamwork, problem solving, these are kind of wishy-washy uh, measures. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, they're real, but, but there's a lot of wiggle room in terms of how people uh, determine somebody's ability in these types of uh, criteria. So uh, use them, but be careful when you use them, uh, and uh, ideally weigh, weigh heavily on the more objective factors. Um, okay, one thing that often gets overlooked is the creation of a RIF review committee. If you can establish one, have a, a group of individuals who are making uh, final decisions on individual determinations who are there in place to monitor the equal employment opportunity issues that are the concern, uh, they can help ensure that there's a uniform process in place, that objective decisions are being made as, as uh, much as possible and that the review is thorough. Um, you know, if you can have uh, minority composition, if you can have age 40 or over composition on your committee, all the better, uh, just in terms of if you ever get sued and you put people up on the stand and you have, have um, evidence to present that these considerations were taken into account, uh, that's always going to help you uh, in litigation context. Um, certainly, you want to have HR involved and you want to have legal involved whenever you can. Um, <clears throat> also, consider how good a witness will this person make? If I put Jane or Jim on the stand, are they, are they going to do well? I don't know. We'll find out. But, but better to better <laughs> better to assume but make that part of the decision making as to who you're putting on your committee. Um, and then the other advantage of having an actual committee is you can scrub what they see. You can you can get rid of identifying information. Uh, you know they get you know objective documentation. These were the skills that were looked at. This person's skills were rated higher than this person's. Uh, easy decision, right? So so those are the kinds of ways that you can use these. Uh, these review committees and fundamentally also don't document your deliberations, document your decisions. Um, okay, uh, so, and then, you know, there's some pressure testing that gets involved uh, here as well. Uh, you're going to use, um, you know, adverse impact analyses whenever possible, um, time permitting. Sometimes things are in a rush, but I always recommend at least considering uh, doing an adverse impact analysis if you can do it. Um, you know, and, and to the extent that you have uh, any particular groups affected, you want to be just scrubbing the results, making sure that your criteria are as business related uh, as possible and not adversely impacting particular groups. Uh, and obviously try to keep those uh, materials privileged. Uh, use your in-house counsel, use out-house out -house counsel, I like to say it, uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, disparate impact claims. So you've got two potential claims in reduction force, disparate impact, disparate treatment claims, slightly different standards. Uh, disparate impacts uh, under Title VII and related statutes, really your defense is business necessity. Business necessity. It's a higher bar uh, than under the Age Discrimination and Unemployment Act. It's a light, slightly lower bar there, which is the reasonable factor other than age. It's a little easier to prove. Uh, it's just something to bear in mind when you're having to, to uh, rejigger uh, perhaps your selection criteria because you've no noticed an impact. Uh, just know that for age analysis, it's a little easier to, to cross the bar. Okay, important to get the data up front uh, that you need, uh, you know, making sure the legal is involved. Um, you're going to have a standard deviation analysis uh, if you do an adverse impact. Uh, there's some other tests for smaller groups, something called the Fisher's exact test. Um, ideally, you know, when you're doing these uh, data analyses, the, they're most useful when you have a group that's about 30 uh, or more and at least five uh, impacted employees in each group and at least five uh, protected employees in each category. Beyond that, the statistics get a little less useful uh, from an evidentiary standpoint. Um, anytime you're, you get a, an analysis back uh, and you have a, showing an adverse impact on a, on a minority group, perhaps, or uh, on older workers, 
uh, you always have to think about uh, what to do. Uh, so the first thing you really want to do is just reevaluate the criteria you've utilized to see if any particular criterion is having an impact uh, on those selections. If you can't find one, um, then you know you you really have to weigh the risk of well, if I change something now, am I engaging in reverse discrimination? So uh, that's that's something that's always in, to be borne in mind. Good news is with an age issue, age claim, uh, you, you can't discriminate against people who are under the age of 40. So if, uh, that's a little simpler. Uh, you can fix those uh, more readily. But uh, but when you're dealing with race, gender, et cetera, um, you, know, you have to be more careful. All right, I'll keep this part quick because I think we're already at time, but um, severance agreements. Uh, to get an enforceable age waiver under the ADEA, uh, you're going to have to follow the dictates of the Older Worker Benefits Protection Act. Um, in short, uh, there are some knowing and voluntary requirements uh, that are required uh, as part of this analysis. You'll need to have uh, at, this, at the back end of your release uh, what's known as the OWBPA disclosure when you have a group uh, that is being offered uh, a package. Um, I won't go into great detail here because we're a little short on time, but there are some requirements as to what should be in your release. 45-day uh, notice uh, consideration period for those groups, uh, 21 days if it's just a single termination. Uh, don't forget the revocation period that's involved. Um, you know, you have to explicitly lay out uh, that the ADEA is being waived as part of the release, uh, et cetera. I won't go into every one here, but um, when you have this OWBPA disclosure, the type of information that needs to be laid out in it is what is the decisional unit that you're dealing with? Uh, what were the eligibility factors for the program? In other words, the program is really the severance package that you're offering, right? Um, time limits that are applicable. Uh, and then when you list uh, the affected employees, you're actually just listing job titles uh, and their ages. And the ages are a numeric age, 49, 30, 27. It's not the birth date, okay? So uh, those are the kind of things you want on there. Um, and usually I... Make sure that the date that's at issue is somewhere on that document. Sometimes that gets left out, but I think it's uh, it should be the decision date, the final decision date that you're dealing with. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, that gets left off. I think it's important to put it on there. Um, <clears throat> and then fundamentally, you have to identify which groups, uh, individuals were selected and which ones were not selected. Uh, and it'll look something like this. So uh, you have. Uh, note the breakdown also in titles. You've got, you know, HR generalist one, HR generalist two. You are required to break it out that specifically when you're dealing with titles. Uh, and then you might have, you know, five individuals uh, for HR generalist one, their ages, and then those who are selected or not selected and based on the different columns that they're in there. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm going to skip over some of this only because I covered it already, but generally use, you know, non-complex language in these releases uh, don't include a release and a covenant not to sue without explaining the difference between the two most people wouldn't know what that difference is unless it's clearly explained in english um, you know they have to be advised to consult an attorney and again refer to those adea rights um, there is a group termination program concept basically if you're laying off two employees you have a group okay <laughs> that's, that's just remember that it's more than one <laughs> so um okay um, again, the decisional unit is usually the, it's, that's usually the hardest part. What's their, what's, what's the decisional unit that we're dealing with? Um, fundamentally, the question is always, what was the instruction from above? What, what that goes right back to that RIF business plan we talked about earlier. Um, what was the goal? What was the instruction? And at some point, again, sometimes it morphs, uh, but it, fundamentally you have to figure out what group were we really looking at uh, when we were deciding whether to, to lay somebody off or not lay, lay somebody off and off the package? Um, so sometimes it's limited to a department. Sometimes it's the entire company. Uh, if, if the dictate was we need to reduce the workforce by 10 percent, well, that's the whole company. Right. And, and employers are sometimes loath to disclose that broadly. But at the end of the day, uh, you will get in more trouble by under disclosing than over disclosing. So better to better over disclose. <laughs> Going to cover that already. Yeah, we talked about selection criteria. Do include those. Um, one bit about rolling riffs. Um, you know, at the end of the day, riffs are often conducted in phases. You'll have one group that's been 
decided upon uh, while you're still figuring out what you're doing with the next group. The, the, re the reality is that the requirement is only that you provide cumulative information to the later groups. So if, if it's all, if there are three related phases, uh, that third group will get all the data for the prior two, whereas the first group will not. We'll just get the information for the first group. You don't have to supplement uh, information to that first group. Um, yeah, don't, don't engage in duress, fraud, misstatements on your OWBPA, OWBPA waivers. Uh, if there's a mistake in those things, it's it's on you. <laughs> so it's important that those the OWBPA disclosures are accurate. <clears throat> yeah, and it's also important to know that that just because uh, HR or legal is looking at uh, your uh, decisional unit, that doesn't change the scope of what you have to disclose. However, if a manager goes back and says, I'm gonna review which group should be getting this package or should be considered for, for layoff, that's gonna change the scope of your decisional unit. So, um, all right. I'm not gonna go into detail because we're out of time, but I'm happy to answer any and all questions about WARN, CalWARN, uh, 50 state mini WARN Act uh, laws, uh, there's a lot to go into there, but uh, we're past time, so I'm not gonna, I'm not going to cover that piece. But uh, just know, you know, many states have these uh, WARN Act requirements. Uh, sometimes it's 90 days notice, sometimes it's 60 days notice. Uh, it depends, but uh, we'll cover that perhaps in another session. Then, because we're done. Okay. Any questions while we're still sitting here that don't involve a drink in our hands? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so best practice is to en engage in a hiring freeze. Uh, if, if you have uh, a reduction in force, you should basically say for the next year, we're not going to hire anybody and we're not going to backfill any of these rules. I mean, that's fundamentally the best practice. That's the reality. Nobody likes to do that. <laughs> that's how you understand, but that's optically uh, and, and in terms of defending against the claim of discrimination, that's going to be your better position. So, yeah. Yeah, that gets a little trickier only because there may be business reasons. Uh, you know, now we're going to outsource this function. That's somewhat different. Um, but, um, you know, certainly if, if someone is claiming that they were discriminated against based on age, they might point to the fact that, oh, now you've hired all these 26 somethings, uh, you know, to do the same role. So, again, if there, as long as there's a reasonable factor other than age in that circumstance, yes, we are, we are doing this because we have to outsource it because we don't want to engage the managers who then have to run this entire department. We're saving money doing it this way. So there, there are ways to, to do that. It's a little different when you're, when you're using outsourced uh, work, but, uh, you know, there's caution to be exercised for sure. Yes. Possibly. Yeah. So you have to make a decision. How important is this to us? Is this something that we're, we're willing to pay employees to engage in this type of activity? Um, then, then, yeah, but that, that's, a, that's a very good point. Did everybody hear what she, what she said? So, um, she pointed out that if you're going to include. Things like I gave the example of Habitat for Humanity. So if you're going to say like this is our big um, community outreach project that we do, um, and it's it's if you can say like, it's it's voluntary, but we feel like it's a very important thing for our employees to participate in. You run the risk that that, that could be compensatory time, absolutely. And so you have to decide: is that something that's really is that really something that's important to us, where we're going to pay employees to show up and do this, um, or and obviously this is going to impact your your non-exempt. Folks, um, not your exempt folks, but for your non exempt folks, is this something that um, we would pay them to do? And if we're not going to pay them to do, then we probably shouldn't be including it as a performance factor that's weighted in any discernible way. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Food is waiting. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Make sure you, you. Uh, do your CLE sign in. <laughs>
oh, yeah. grab your materials and grab a cocktail and some appetizers. And we're open for more questions.